Happy Father's Day, Saddleback. It's too bad that Danny Gokey can't sing. I have to get that guy some song lessons there. Here at our Lake Forest campus this weekend, it's also Worship Together weekend, so it's good to see a bunch of our students uh, in our monthly combined service together, and uh, some of you brought your dads with you, and I'm really glad you're here for that. In the Bible, uh, God often compares living your life to building a building. And he says, just like with a building, you can build a good life or a bad life, a strong life or a weak life. You can build a life that leaves a legacy, makes an impact, a life of greatness. Or you can just blow your life. You can waste it. You can, you can do nothing with it. You have really three options to do with your life. You can, you can waste your life, you can, you can spend your life, or you can invest your life. Now, the greatest use of life is to invest it in that which outlasts it. The greatest use of your life is to invest it in that which outlasts it. You can waste your life. There's lots of ways to waste your life. You can spend your life. You can spend it watching TV. You can spend your life reading stupid novels and and dumb uh, magazines. You can can waste, you can spend your life shopping. You can spend it on the golf course. There are lots of ways to spend your life. But at the end of it, nothing's really gonna matter. Or you can actually build a great life. And this Father's Day, that's what I want us to look at. How do I build a great life? A life of significance, a life of meaning, a life of purpose. Now, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as I said, compares living to to building a building. And in 1 Corinthians 3.10 he says this. Using the gift that God gave me, I did the work of an expert builder. Paul says, I'm a good builder. I know how to build a life, I know how to build a ministry, I know how to build things, I'm an expert builder. And he says, now each of you, each of you must be careful how you build. I wanna begin this weekend by asking this question. What are you building with your life? What are you building with your life? I mean, what are you doing with it? You just going through life, cruising, coasting, letting life happen to you, or are you actually building something significant with your life? Now you can do a lot of different things with your life. You can, you can build a lot of it. You could be a bodybuilder. And uh, your goal of life is simply to perfect your body and, and look like me. I resemble that remark. (laughs) So you can be a bodybuilder. You can be a career builder. And you can spend your whole life gaining promotions, climbing the ladder of cultural or corporate success. And you're a career builder. That's what you do, you build a career. Uh, A lot of people are wealth builders. And the whole goal of life is simply to make more money and to amass it and to acquire it and to stockpile it and and the goal of your life is to gain more and more and every year you evaluate your life on how am I doing financially? Do I have more than I had last year? So then I feel good. You're a wealth builder. You could be a, you could be a nest builder and your, your goal is simply to create a beautiful home and you get all the right decor and all the right accessories and all the right accoutrements and features and and at the end of your life you have a beautiful home to show. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of these things, building your body, your career, your wealth, your nest. The problem is none of them are gonna last. And you weren't put here on life, on earth, simply to make money and die, make a beautiful house and die, build a career and die, or build up your muscles and die. No, no, you were made for far, far more than that. And your life is going to outlast your time on earth. God wants you to be what's called a kingdom builder. What is a kingdom builder? It's someone who builds the kingdom of God. So what is the kingdom of God? It is God's purpose for your life. It is God's plan for your life. It is God's goal for your life. God has never made anything without a purpose and he made you for a purpose. 
And to be a kingdom builder means I cooperate with God's plan for the universe and God's plan for my life. And then I don't go after my plan and my purpose and my dreams. I say, God, what do you want? What did you put me on this planet to be? When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's a redundant statement. Wherever God's will is done, God's kingdom has come. And when you're doing God's will and you're living God's plan and you're fulfilling the purpose you were made for, then the kingdom of God has come in your life. So to be a kingdom builder means that I say I want God's plan and purpose for my life, not my own, and that's the key to a great life, to be a kingdom builder. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter six. It's part of the Lord's, uh, I mean, part of the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, seek first, not second, not third, not last. Make your top priority in life. Seek first God's kingdom his plan, purpose, and his righteousness. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And all the other things will be given to you as well. All those other things that everybody else builds their life around, he said, you'll get that too, but if you put me first, then all these other things will come into, into play. Now this Father's Day, I want us to look at five characteristics of a great life. Five characteristics of a life that makes an impact, that leaves a legacy, that makes a difference. It's really how to be a kingdom builder. And the Bible tells us five things. Number one, you might write these down. Number one, the first key to a great life is make God the foundation. Make God the foundation of my life. You see, the foundation always determines the size and the strength of any building. A building cannot grow larger or wider or stronger than the foundation allows it. And if you don't have a strong foundation for your life, you're not gonna have a strong life. If you have a wimpy, weak foundation, you're gonna have a wimpy, weak life. So what's the foundation of your life? If I said right now, explain to me the foundation of your life. Do you even know what it is? If you don't even know what it is, how in the world can you build anything of significance on it? A a number of years ago, I built a log house uh, up in Northern California on the backside of Yosemite, at the back of Carson Peak and June Lake. I bought some land and uh, cleared 38 trees and built a log cabin on that property. It took me two years, because I wasn't building it all at the same time, I wasn't working on it full time. In the first summer, I was there for 10 weeks, and I worked 12 hours a day, and at the end of the summer, all I had to show for it was a solid, stable, secure, and squared cement foundation. I was pretty discouraged. I'd taken out all these trees, and then because there was an underground spring on this piece of land, which is why nobody wanted to buy it, Uh, and I I had to build a French drain to drain the the, the land. What's French drain? Well, it was a 60-foot trench, five feet deep, four feet wide, and I dug the whole thing with a shovel. And that's why it took me 10 weeks. And then we filled that with gravel and then covered it over so that the, it could do it. And once the land was dried, then I could start working on squaring and leveling and building a concrete slab foundation. And at 10 weeks, I was pretty discouraged. My dad, though, who was an expert builder, said, don't worry, son, once you've got the foundation settled, the hardest part is behind you. That's true of life. Life gets easier when you know what your foundation is. If you don't know what your foundation is, you're asking yourself a question, what should I do next all the time? Because you don't have a foundation. Now the Bible says, if you wanna be a great person and you wanna have a great life, you gotta have a great foundation. And a foundation has to be something that is unchangeable. You build your house on sand, When the earthquakes come and the rogue winds blow and the rains come down, you're gonna be wiped out. When you build your house on a rock solid foundation, you can handle enormous stress, enormous pressure, enormous attacks because you're solid on a solid foundation. Let's look at what the Bible says. Proverbs 24, verse three. Through godly wisdom, that's God's wisdom, a life, a home, and a family is built. 
You build a good life, a good home, and a good family on godly wisdom. And through understanding, it is established on a solid foundation, on a sound foundation. It's unmovable. Now, everything in your life is going to change except one thing, God. So he's the only solid foundation. Everything else is gonna change. You build a foundation on your career, your career is gonna end. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 3.11, no one can lay any other foundation than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Why, because he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let me just cut through the fog and say it this way. The reason why so many marriages failed, they were never built on the right foundation in the first place. The reason why so many careers fail, they were never built on the right foundation in the first place. The reason why so many lives fall apart, crack up, and fail is because they were never built on the right foundation in the first place. They had no solid basis. The Bible says, Proverbs 12, three, you can't find firm footing in a swamp, but a life rooted in God stands firm. The stuff you see on TV, that's a swampland. The stuff you hear on the radio, that's a swampland. You need something more solid than that. That's Father's Day, so dads, you want your kids to feel secure? You want your kids to feel stable? You want your kids to feel that they are protected? Then build your life on the foundation of God's word. Proverbs 14, 26 says this. Reverence for God gives a man deep strength. Reverence for God gives a man deep strength. That's where man's strength comes from. It says his children have a place of refuge and security. When my three kids were growing up, they knew I didn't have all the answers. And I never pretended to have all the answers because I don't have all the answers. But they grew up stable and secure because they knew that I reverenced God. And God does have all the answers. And so when I didn't know the answers, I could go to my knees and I could pray, I could look into God's word, and they knew I didn't have to be smart, but God was smart. And that gave them strength and security. I love the way the message translates Hebrews 11, one, there on your outline. Faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. See, there's far more to life than what we see. We see the physical, we see the material, but life's far more than physical material, you know that. There's spiritual aspects, there are emotional aspects, there are relational aspects. There's a lot more to life than just physical and material. And the way we get a handle on the stuff we can't see, the Bible says, is by having a firm foundation of faith under everything. And that, he says, makes life worth living. Number two, the second key to living a great life is this. Remember what matters most. I need to remember what matters most. And what is it that matters most? It's love. The Bible says that God created you in order to be loved and God wants you to learn how to love. And the whole purpose of him putting you on this planet is for you to learn how to love. One day, a guy comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, what's the most important command? And Jesus says, I'll summarize it up in this. It's all about love. Love your neighbors, yourself, and love God with all your heart. He said, that's it, that's the great commandment. Now, you can, you can have all kinds of acquisitions and accomplishments and achievements and things like that, but if you don't love, you miss the purpose of life. It's learning how to love, how to love God and how to love each other. Now, the reason why we forget this is because the world doesn't reward it. The world rewards everything else. The world rewards accomplishment, so we focus on accomplishment. And the world rewards achievement, so we focus on achievement. And the world rewards appearance, so we focus on looking good. And the world rewards acquisition, so we focus on getting more and more and more. You're never gonna see an award show on the most unselfish person in the world. The most sacrificial, self-giving, compassionate, loving person. Why? The world doesn't reward that. 
So we have to go back to the Bible and remind ourselves of what matters most. Not accomplishments, not acquisitions, but relationships. The Bible says this, Galatians 5, 6. The only thing that counts, circle only thing, the only thing that counts in life is faith expressing itself through love. When you stand before one God one day at the judgment, he's not gonna say, how much money did you make on earth? He's not gonna say, how, much, uh, how many achievements did you, did you accomplish? He, he's not gonna say, were you a beautiful person? Were you the handsomest or the best looking, or the most stunning person? No, he's gonna say, did you love? Did you do what I put you on earth to do? Did you learn to love me? And did you learn to love other people? Did you learn to be unselfish? Or was really life all about you? He says, the only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul gets even more clear. He gets in your face on this. He says this, if I could speak with human or angelic eloquence, in other words, I'm the best speaker on the planet, but I didn't love, it would be just noise. And if I could predict the future and explain every mystery, but I didn't love others, it would be worthless. And if I had such great faith that I could move mountains without love, it would mean nothing. And even if I gave all my possessions to the poor and sacrificed my body without love, it would be of no value. I'm gonna give you a little equation right now and I want you to memorize it. It's more important than E equals MC squared. <laughs> Write this down. Life minus love equals zero. Life minus love equals zero. Nada, nothing, zip. It's a cipher, it's nothing. It's incomplete. In fact, without love, you're not living, you're just existing. Now, the reason why we forget this, as I said, is because we're always thinking about other things and we think other things are more important. And what happens is that when you get too busy, you start skimming on relationships. You think that work is more important than relationships. And so you skim on relationships with your husband, with your wife, with your kids, with whoever. And they're the ones who get cheated because love gets pushed out because I've got too many things to do and what I've got to do is more important than love. Wrong, wrong. I remember many, many years ago when my three kids were in grade school and preschool probably at the same time. And I had had a pretty busy day and I had done some things that I thought were important. I had met with some important people and made some important decisions and I had a pretty, pretty full plate. And I came home uh, from the office and I was exhausted and I opened the door and my three kids were there on the carpet in the living room. And I love my kids, I, I do. But in that moment I thought, I love my kids, but I'm too tired and I've got nothing to give to them. I don't really have time for this. Besides, what I'm doing and what I did today is more important. And I remember walking into my study and I sat down and I opened my Bible and I read this verse, Luke chapter nine, where Jesus says this, verse 48. Anyone who takes care of a little child is caring for me. This is God talking. Anyone who takes care of a little child is caring for me. Your care for others is the measure of your greatness. Not your accomplishments, not your achievements, not your fame, not your press releases, but your measure of greatness is your care for others. And then I had to say, God, I'm sorry. Since it's Father's Day, let's just deal with this myth. Because the myth that many of us grew up with is that taking care of the kids is mom's job and dad's job is just put food on the table. Let's read that verse again. 
Anyone who takes care of a little child, that means dads too. Anyone who takes care of a little child is caring for me. You're doing as if for Jesus. And that is the measure of your greatness. And that's what God's gonna look at one day, is how well you loved, not what you did. Number three, the third secret of a great life, of making an impact, of building a life of significance, is you must gather the right companions. I must gather the right companions. I must associate with the right people. I must build the right friends, and I must stay away from the wrong kind of friends. For good or for bad, those people that you choose to associate with are gonna determine your success or failure in life. The people you choose as your closest friends will determine the direction of your life. And if you choose people who pull you away from God, you'll be pulled away from God. If you choose people who push you toward greatness, you'll become great. It's like that old cliche, you can't soar with the eagles if you're walking with the turkeys. Now just think about your friends. Are those friends actually helping you become a great person or are they keeping you in mediocrity or even pulling you down? If I stand here on the side of this stage and I'm trying to lift you up and you're trying to pull me down, who's gonna win? Gravity naturally means it's easier to pull somebody down than for you to pull them up. If you have friends who are not pushing you toward greatness, they are not your friends. They're losers. And if you hang out with losers, you'll be a loser. You hang out with fools, you'll be a fool. You hang out with people who party all the time, you'll be good at getting drunk. And that's it. They're not causing you to be great. They're not causing you to build a great life. They're not causing you to be significant. They're tearing down your self-esteem, not building it up because that's the way they feel about themselves. The Bible makes a big deal that you must be very careful in choosing the right friends if you intend for your life to have any kind of significance. Let's look at some verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says this. Don't be fooled. Bad companions ruin good character. You got any companions that'll ruin your character? When you get around them, you tend to cuss more. You talk dirty, you use slang, you gossip, you know, I mean, they're not helping you out. Bad companions ruin good character. They're not your friends. Proverbs 14, seven, escape quickly from the company of fools. They're a waste of your time and words. A couple weeks ago I was in Saddleback San Clemente and a guy got up and gave a wounded warrior testimony on the Memorial weekend and he said, you know, I was raised in a real rough area of town and all my, my friends, all they cared about was drugs and fighting. And he goes, I decided I'm gonna make something of my life. And in his decision, he went out and joined the military and he went on and told this whole story and how his brother lost his life in a gang-related death. And I just thought, there's a guy who chose to do something significant with his life. The Bible says in Proverbs 2.20, join the company of good men and good women. That's the kind of people you ought to hang out with. Join the company of good men and women who will keep your feet on the right and true path. Where do you do that? Church. That's a good place to find good men and women who will keep your feet on the right path. Now, we've talked about this so much, I don't have to go into detail. We're better together. Any change you want to make in your life, you'll make it longer and it'll last longer. You'll make it faster and it'll last longer if you do it with other people. You can change anything in your life by willpower for about 90 days. Then you get tired and you go back to your old ways. I mean, we know this. I mean, if, if, where are you more likely to be consistent in a physical workout, by yourself or with a partner? I can hear the guilt in your mind right now. It doesn't matter what it is. If, if you need recovery in some area from a hurt or a habit or a hang up, you're gonna get better, not on your own, you're gonna get better in the company of community. We're better together. Doesn't matter whether it's Bible study, Daniel plan or anything, everything works better when we do it in a fellowship. 
guys, many of you don't know that since 1997, we've had a Thursday morning Bible study in this building right here, Lake Forest Worship Center, every Thursday morning from 6.30 to 7.30. It's been going since 1997. I'm gonna be teaching it this week. I'm gonna teach the second part of this message. I wanna ask every man to join me, join the company of good men this Thursday morning. Just come once, come once. Come at 6.30 this Thursday morning as we talk about living a life of significance. Now there's a fourth thing that God says to do, and it is this, I commit to a great purpose. If you want to be a great man, if you wanna be a great woman, You need a great purpose for your life. You need a great cause. This is actually the secret of greatness. There are no great people in the world, only great causes, great purposes. And great people are simply ordinary people who make a great commitment to a great cause. And that draws it out of themselves. You need something bigger than yourself to draw you out of yourself to bring out the greatness that can be in you. But it ain't gonna happen if you're just living for you. If you're only living for you, what's the whole value of getting up in the morning? Why not just call it in and say I'm sick? You need something bigger than yourself to live for. And greatness comes when ordinary people make a great commitment to a great cause or a great great purpose. I remember when I started Saddleback, I said, Lord, give me a slogan that can last me my lifetime for our church. And it was this, a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. And we've never wavered from that. The two great statements of Jesus are the great commandment, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, and the great commission, which the peace plan is all about. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great Christian. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. A great commitment to the great commandment, the great commission will grow a great company, a great community, a great corporation, a great country. We only become great by giving ourselves to something greater than us, and there is nothing greater than the kingdom of God. It's the only thing that's going to last. Your career, your hobby, even your family is not gonna last, but the kingdom of God is gonna last forever. When you make that commitment, it draws greatness out of you. Now let's look at some verses. Matthew 20, Jesus says this in verse 26. Whoever wants to be great must become what? A servant, circle that, a servant. Now that is the truth in any occupation you have. If you wanna be a great teacher, you must serve your pupils. If you wanna be a great salesman, you must serve your customers. If you wanna be a great businessman, you must serve your clients. If you wanna be a great politician or government leaders, you must serve your constituency. If you wanna be a great pastor, you must serve your congregation. If you wanna be a great coach, you must serve those you are coaching. In any area of life, the key to greatness is not getting on an ego trip and posting a PR statement about yourself. The key to greatness is service. And God has wired the universe that the more you give your life away to help others, the more it raises you up yourself. I call it the Mother Teresa syndrome. She went to the poorest of the poor and helped them and became one of the most influential people in the world. That's God's upside down kingdom. And greatness comes from service. Jesus said it like this in Mark 8. If you insist on saving your life for yourself, you will lose it. Only those who give their lives away for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it means to really live. Only those who give their lives away will ever know what it means to really live. First John two seventeen: the world and all its desires, that's all those things that everybody else wants, it's all gonna pass away. But the man who does the will of God will live forever. That's committing to a great cause. Now let me just clarify something. Everybody here listening to my voice, if you're a follower of Christ, you are called by God to serve him full time. 
Not everybody's called to serve in a church, but everybody is called into Christian service if you're a Christian. If you claim to be a believer, if you claim to be going to heaven, you claim to be in God's family, the call to salvation and the call to service are one and the same. They are together. Every Christian is called into full-time ministry. Now let me clarify that. Not everybody's called to be a pastor, not everybody's called to work in a church, but wherever you are, you are called to use whatever job you've got as a ministry to help others. Ministry is helping others in Jesus' name. We serve God by serving others. Let me show you a verse. Colossians 3, 23, it's up here on the screen, it says this. Whatever you do, now let me stop there. You may be an attorney or you may be a taxi cab driver. You may be a manicurist or you may be a doctor. You may drive a truck or you may teach preschool. I don't care what you do. You may be salesman, project manager, supercomputer scientist. Whatever you do, the Bible says, you are, God commands you to work at it with all your heart. Why? Because you are working for the Lord, not for people. Your boss is not your real boss. Your real boss is the Lord. Your boss may suck, <laughs> but your real boss is God. And so the Bible says, whatever you do, I may flip hamburgers, or I might write, I might write public policy, or I might be a diplomat, or I might be a donut maker. The bottom line is, whatever you do, I'm to do it because I'm in full-time ministry. If you're in the United States Marine Corps, the government pays your wages, but you're a minister of Jesus Christ. And, it, and if you're a teacher, the school district may pay your wages, but you are a minister of Jesus Christ. And you are to treat everyone, no matter what they believe or who they are or what they live, or, with respect, dignity, and, and nothing but love. You're to be Jesus to those people. We're all in full-time ministry. I want you to write this down and then I'll explain it. My occupation is not my vocation. Would you write that down? My occupation is not my vocation. These are two different words you need to understand. Your occupation is your job. Your job will change many, 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 many times in your life. You'll have many different jobs. That's your occupation, your current occupation. Your vocation is your calling, and it will never, ever change. It stays the same your entire life. Vocation comes from the Latin word voce. We get the word vocal, vocalize, voice. It means your calling. Every person is called by God to full-time ministry, to serve. There's no such thing as part-time ministry to God. You're, you're either in full-time or you're not doing it at all. And so the Bible says that we are to give ourselves in ministry regardless of what we do. Now I wanna remind you that when Jesus called the 12 original disciples, his first followers, John and Peter and Matthew and all these guys, Jesus did not call teenagers to follow him. Jesus did not call college students to come follow him. When Jesus called people to come into full-time Christian ministry, church ministry, he called full-time grown men, successful businessmen, to leave their careers and follow him. Every one of those guys left their career to follow Jesus full-time. Every one of them. Matthew was a government official. He worked for the IRS of that day, collected taxes. Andrew and, and Peter and, and John, those guys were professional fishermen. They had a very successful business. All these guys were successful businessmen. None of them had gone to Bible school. None of them had gone to seminary. Jesus started the church with businessmen. Let me show you the verse up here on the screen. Mark chapter one. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, uh, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for their fishermen. They had a commercial fishing business. They still do commercial fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus said, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Now here's the key. At once they left their nets. Oh, that phrase is pregnant with meaning. They left their nets and followed him. What does it mean? They made a career change. 
God called grown men to leave their careers and follow him. Would you do that if God asked you to do that? Would you leave your nets? You say, wait a minute, I've built a pretty successful career. Well, these guys had too. Would you do that? I'm not saying God's gonna tell you that to do that. I'm saying he might. And I'm saying you, whether he does or not, have to be willing. To, it, greatness comes saying, God, I will serve you anywhere, any way, anytime, anyway. I know you'd never use me in a church. You know, anytime you tell God what can't be done, listen for laughter in heaven. You may be surprised to know that most of the pastors here at Saddleback Church, and we have a staff of well over 300 at Saddleback Church, but most of the pastors here did not go to seminary and then Bible school, seminary, and then become a pastor. They weren't in, you know, have a, born with a halo on their head. <laughs> most of the pastors at Saddleback Church were successful businessmen. And they heard Jesus say, I want you to leave your net and I want you to follow me, and they did. I mean, I think of Pastor Glenn. Pastor Glenn had a 20-year career in the military before he had a 25-year career as a pastor here at Saddleback. Pastor Steve Rutenbar, I remember, was scared to death that I could never be a pastor when I first met him 30 years ago. And uh, he was the president of a national retail association. And I could just go down the list. In fact, I thought it would be kind of fun on Father's Day for you to just hear some stories of normal people who are actually made the switch to drop their nets. And I want you to just welcome some of our Saddleback pastors that you never or rarely see on stage. Would you welcome them right now? They're gonna come out here for a minute. Come on out, guys. Now, I, 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 this will be painless, you guys, so. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about who could be a pastor, and a lot of people, well, I could never be a pastor. Well, wait till you hear their stories. Um, let's just go down the row here, and first thing, uh, tell your name and, um, and tell what businesses uh, you were involved in before you uh, uh, came on staff as a pastor at Saddleback Church. Hi, I'm John Baker, and I was the vice president of marketing for Oro Wheat Breads and a regional manager for Scott Paper Company. All right. Now, you don't have to clap over each of these. We'd clap 32 times, so just. So I'm Rob Jacobs, and my path wound through the Marine Corps, industrial sales, law enforcement, and then uh, ended up leading a, a public school. All right. Hi, I'm Dave Arnold, and I was uh, chief operating officer of uh, medical manufacturing companies. I did mergers, acquisitions, and corporate turnarounds. Okay. Jim Dobbs, uh, started as a designer in an ad agency, worked my way up through uh, corporate, uh, doing art direction, creative direction, last company, Bergen Brunswick Corporation. All right, Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Johnson. I uh, was a CFO, a chief financial officer of a number of private and public software companies. Okay, so all of these guys were just happily involved in their careers, in business, succeeding in the different areas of life. Uh, my question now is number two, how did God get your attention and then uh, what were the steps that led you into full-time church ministry? Well, it was, um, I kind of entered a different way. I'm the founder of Celebrate Recovery, and uh, which means that what qualified for me that was being a uh, alcoholic, a recovering alcoholic. And Celebrate Recovery, it was a... Uh, a so it was a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a can of beer that caused you to, <laughs> to get called by God. Several. Several cans yeah. of beer, all um, right. All right, all right. So see, there's some hope for some of you guys. Right. All right, all right. But okay. celebrate recovery just isn't for alcoholics, for anybody with a hurt, hang up, or habit. Right. But I wrote, I, God gave me a vision. And I mean, I couldn't do anything except try to write down this vision. I think it, back then it was on a typewriter. And uh, yeah. it, was, it ended up that it was a, a very small single space, 13 page letter that I gave to Pastor, to Pastor Rick. Rick. Yeah, 13 and page letter. It's now a very famous letter because this letter was the foundation of Celebrate Recovery, which is now in tens of thousands of churches. It is the official recovery program in every state prison system. And it all started because a drunk was listening to God. All right, yeah. Can't argue with that. Um, and so, 
Rick, I really didn't know him that well. I had certainly shook his hand a few times after leaving church, and he called me into his office, and he gave me those famous words, John, you do it. You're, you're it. <laughs> you're it. Yeah. So for, for me, it happened during the 2005 Super Bowl, um, and by that I mean... During halftime? Yeah, and by that I mean I was sitting on the couch. Okay. Uh, uh-huh. And sitting next to a fraternity brother who was actually on staff at Saddleback, and he looked at me and said... Rob, you need to be working for the church. And I looked at him and said, Brian, you need to be taking your medication. Uh, <laughs> but I figured if, 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 if the church could call a fraternity brother, uh, and, you know, the yeah. reputation is true about us sometimes, and uh, if he, they could use them, then I'm, I'm going to pursue it. So I prayed about it. I thought about it. And for the next six years, I volunteered for the church, thinking if I'm going to work for the church, I need to start serving the church. And eventually another fraternity brother came on staff, and the both of them continued to encourage me and uh, that's, that, that was the path. Great. All right. Great. For me, it started out actually sitting right here, listening in 2013, November, to Rick's uh, peace message, mm-hmm. where he talked about planning churches, equipping servant leaders, mm-hmm. assisting the poor, and caring for the sick, and educating the next generation. And it just, it just grabbed my heart. In fact, it was a big crowd just like this, but it felt like I was the only guy in that room. And when the service ended, my wife leaned over and she said, who, who does that? And I said, I, I really don't know. And she said, you should do that. <laughs> and uh, yeah. This is what me, I call the old Holy Spirit through your wife trick. <laughs> clearly through my wife. I, often when and, Kay uh, speaks, I call her the junior, junior Holy Spirit because when God speaks, it's usually God anyway. So it, 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 Clearly God. And so I uh, called the church and found out who was involved with that and I volunteered. And for the next two years, I actually was a full-time volunteer in that, in that area. Great. Now, now notice that all three of these guys uh, took a baby step by first by volunteering, okay? And, and they just started serving. John served for several years, uh, Rob uh, six years, Dave several years, and, and, and you, it was like learn is on-the-job training. Yeah, okay, Jim? Uh, yeah, we moved to Orange County in 1996 as a family and uh, started a tent here at Saddleback. And uh, hearing Pastor Rick uh, give us uh, the, the real reason why we're at church is to serve and serve the body. So started serving college ministry and then as a designer uh, started serving the church uh, through that. In my job I became a leader and an art director and didn't get to design much. So it was an opportunity for me to use what I loved most yeah. and, and serve uh, here at the church. And it was about six years later that I uh, came on staff. You know, if you've seen all of the changes in the last several years on this campus, you know, like this beautiful canopy outside, and all the changes to the refinery and the, uh, the patio area, and just everything that's beautifying this campus, it's because of the artistic eye of Jim Dobbs. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, great, thank you, Jim. Well, I think um, my first step was uh, my wife, as you yeah. talk about your God speaking through your wife. I think she hounded me for a year <laughs> to, to go to a small group for just, and she kept doing it. And I finally, okay, if I go one time, <laughs> if I just go one time, and uh, so I did. And then, of course, uh, those of you that are in small groups know that that's the beginning that doesn't end because that's God's plan. That's his plan for a community. But the, how he got my attention ultimately uh, is really a two-stepper. I was in uh, one of my, well, actually my last uh, deal, and I got a phone call from uh, a friend who I hadn't talked to for over a year. He was in a large uh, ministry and I knew the words he was going to say before he said them. And I didn't talk to him in a long time. And a tear came down because I knew God was calling me in that moment. So it was this mm. poignant moment that I'm, oh, he's calling me. And he said the words. Steve, we're looking for a chief operating officer. was wondering if you might be interested in, in doing that. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> About as fast as I could. And hung up. And uh, that was the beginning. A couple weeks later, a pastor here had called me uh, to uh, come uh, serve in ministry. And I said no again and uh, began a six-month wrestle with God. You, uh, by the fact I'm sitting here, you know how that turned out. But the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the story goes, I'm in my garage cleaning, six months later, cleaning my garage. And I put a CD on that uh, mm. we missed the weekend 
uh, for that message. And as uh, my dear brother here, Dave, uh, has heard it right there, mm -hmm. I heard it for the first time cleaning my garage, a peace plan. Mm -hmm. And where Rick talked about it was time for the church to be the church and for, um, for us uh, to, as God's original plan, to be the army uh, in this world. And he had me and I broke uh, on my knees, tears coming down and that was it. That's how I got my in, the, in your garage. In my garage. So God called you <laughs> vacuuming in your garage. That's right. <laughs> All right. Now, notice that God gets our attention different ways. God uses pain, okay, okay. God uses friends. Uh, God uses hearing a vision. God uses your wife. God uses a major change in your career. Uh, God uses small groups. All different things. And when God puts an idea in your mind and says, I want you in church ministry. Now maybe not for the rest of your life, maybe for a period of your life. When you start fighting that, you're gonna lose. Because it's gonna bug you and bug you and bug you and bug you because God knows what's gonna make you happy more than you do. God knows what's gonna make you happy more than you do. Now, none of these guys felt like they were prepared when they were called by God to go into church ministry. We're all in ministry, but these guys felt called to go into church ministry. None of them felt prepared. God doesn't call the prepared. He prepares the called. This is an important thing. God doesn't call the prepared. N none of us are prepared for what God wants to do in our lives. But he calls us, and then after he calls us, then he prepares us. That makes sense? So it's not like something happens first and I'm all prepared, now I'm ready to be a pastor or serve on the staff or whatever like that. Now, also, being a pastor doesn't mean you preach. I wouldn't dare let any of these guys preach, okay? But they wouldn't dare let me do what they do. So, for instance, uh, Pastor Steve down here, he is responsible for the massive budget of Saddleback Church. I haven't seen the budget in 33 years. Okay, I mean, I get the big picture, but all the details are all working out on that because everybody has, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Everybody has a different role. Okay, next question. Um, when you guys all got married and you said two words in front of a bunch of people, I do, and you had no idea at that time that you would be a pastor someday, and certainly your wife had no idea that she was marrying a future pastor. So the question is, how did your wife feel about the move into full-time church ministry, and how does she feel about it now? Well, I think I volunteered for a year and a half, and I think that really helped prepare her. Got it. However, when I came home and said, hey, I'm going to be full-time at the church, uh -huh. she, really, she was happy, but she was, I'm not a pastor's wife. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so it was, it was exciting, and as far as now, she has served with me at Celebrate Recovery since the beginning, 23 years ago. And she has certainly brought a lot of, it's for anybody with a hurt, hang up, or habit, a lot of those groups, we had groups for everything. Mm. And she brought a lot of those groups. Mm. And also, one more quick thing, we're gonna be celebrating our 45th wedding anniversary in October. Yeah, fantastic, congratulations, John. Great. Okay, Rob. So. When I told my wife, Julie, about uh, this thought that had been planted in my mind and this, this growing feeling, she just kind of laughed and shrugged her shoulders and said, well, you just transitioned into a new career. Why not already start thinking about the next transition? Um, <laughs> but she, we, she agreed to pray alongside of me through those six years, through all the delays and the doubts and the distractions and, the, and those, those things that naturally happen. And coincidentally, on the, the week that I was called into um, full-time ministry here at Saddleback, was the week that we agreed to step out in faith uh, after listening to a message from Pastor Rick about adoption. And so she and I agreed in the same week to adopt our son from Korea, and a few days later I was brought on staff at wow. Saddleback. Wow, wow. New baby, new, new job at the same time. Congratulations. Hey, Dave? My wife, Katie, is uh, one of the most godly women I know, and uh, she did a 25-year run with me through the corporate uh, ladder and so she was been a supportive side by side with me and she remains that way in ministry um, huh. it's it's tough like corporate yeah. long hours travel um, it's a people business so there's lots of things going on and you, you need somebody who's uh, behind and supportive and last night I asked her the same question she said I'm proud of you I, I like being part of it great okay 
<laughs> uh, 12 years ago, uh, Teresa and I were, uh, I was working in a corporation here in Orange County and we went through a merger. Mm. And uh, we were offered to move to Pennsylvania. And uh, we flew out there, looked at property, and uh, my wife and I prayed about it that night in a hotel. And uh, God clearly said to both of us, no, you're not, you're not supposed to go. Mm. So we, we went through the process of saying to the new corporation, God never calls going. anybody to Pennsylvania. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. And so uh, Teresa, Teresa was, uh, you know, we held hands through it together. We prayed together about it. And um, we were united in that decision to not, not choose and putting our, our future um, felt like on hold. We were saying, you know, I'm going to eventually get laid off. And, and uh, through being involved here, meeting Pastor Tom through a unique situation, it was uh, uh, given the opportunity to share what I do for a living, and then God opened the door here. So Teresa, I uh, asked her yesterday, and she said, she said, man, it's been, it's been an amazing, surprising ride. Um, and I said, what about now? And she said, it's still an amazing, surprising ride. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Uh, so uh, when I first got this message, it was easy on the front end because the front end was what, what did uh, Cher think about it at the front end. And the truth is she knew before I did. That six-month struggle I talked about, she knew way before. She knew it was right, and uh, she patiently waited for stubborn Steve to uh, work through it mm -hmm. and have my uh, discussions with God. The second half was, was more difficult. Uh, these guys didn't say it, but a few of us were in the, uh, when we first got the question, we were thinking, I don't know, what would she say? <laughs> and I, I'm certainly one of those that was, uh, was, really didn't know. So I texted her. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the last service, I actually decided I wasn't going to pull my phone out again. And I actually couldn't remember the exact words, so I have to pull it out this time again. <laughs> so the, uh, I texted her, well, what do you think about it now? And the reason that I ask her, it's, um, while I'm ashamed to say I don't know, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's the greatest privilege on the planet for me. Mm -hmm. But it's hard. And that means uh, it covers um, your family as well. Mm -hmm. So I texted her. And her response, see if I can get it here without fumbling around. Uh, and I've learned not to uh, say her words for her. Um, <laughs> so, anyways, here was her response. Uh, it's a huge blessing to have this struggle. Huh. See, I could have stopped right there. And she could have said, it's a huge burden, it's a huge trial, it's yeah. a huge, you know, put your adjective in there, but she said it's a huge blessing to have this struggle. And what you don't know is I, I belong to the same uh, club as John. I spent 10 years wreaking havoc with my wife and working hard and partying hard, and there is no reason that I should be sitting here or that she should be married to me even, mm. uh, but she did. And so it's a huge blessing to have this struggle compared to the stress of all the unknowns and brokenness of the past. Uh, so I anchor that. It is, uh, that's my answer. Great, <laughs> thanks. All right, now, now, now as I said, God doesn't call most people into full-time church work, but God calls everybody into full-time ministry, and God may call you into uh, church work. Knowing where Saddleback is going the next five years, I can tell you absolute with confidence that God is gonna call hundreds of men and hundreds of women into full-time church ministry in this church in the next five years, and it may be you. Now you say, Rick, you don't know my past. Let me remind you that most of the Bible was written by three murderers. <laughs> Moses was a murderer, David was a murderer, and Paul was a murderer. So, what's your problem? <laughs> okay, so what are you saying? Well, God couldn't use me. Really? Really? Okay, uh, so last question is lightning round. One sentence answers, or at the most two. And don't clap, we'll wait till everybody's done at the end. Um, what advice would you give uh, to a guy 
who might be sitting here uh, today and might be afraid to even consider the question, not even ask God, would you might want me in full-time church ministry? It's so scary uh, to drop my nets like Peter and Andrew did and leave a successful business and, and follow Jesus. What's, what, what's the word of advice would you give to him? Well, for myself, and I think this could be with a lot of you, is that you think you're gonna judge yourself not worthy. Hmm. And you're gonna say, I'm just not good enough to serve God full time. Well, guess what? You're not, and neither am I. But because of God's grace, we are, and don't let anybody ever tell you anything different. Good, great, all right, Rob? I would say start stretching. Uh, Church ministry makes you very flexible. And don't wait. Go out right now on the patio. Find an usher. Find somebody and say, how do I volunteer? I want to start now. Great. Good, good advice. Yeah, move against your fear. Uh-huh. Trust God. Uh-huh. And start, start. Take a baby step. Get involved. Volunteer. Bring your uh-huh. skills. Hmm. I, I would seriously pray that prayer that Pastor Rick talks about, the most dangerous prayer. Use me. Yeah. And walk out in faith. Faith and risk always go together. Um. You know, I uh, moved a, co- a month ago, and I was cleaning out my desk, and I had a number of trophies, literally trophies. They were acrylics from my businesses and things that I had done. Who, and I used to just, uh, they defined me. It was who I was. And so they were trophies of my success, and I found myself in the move thinking, well, what do I need these for? Hmm. And I, I literally threw them away. Hmm. Um, because uh, during that time, you asked what, you know, what, what was the beginning. And I, that six-month struggle, it was this challenge of success versus significance. Mm. Success versus significance. Mm. So think on that. Uh, and what you're doing uh, may f- fall right into the significance. But I know when he called, that was the moment. It was, well, are you going to spend the rest of your life uh, just being successful? Hmm. Or are you going to be significant? Oh, great. All right, let's hear it for these guys. Ah. All right, you guys, you guys are going to sit here because I'm going to finish the sermon from right here. One of the things you just said, Steve, uh, I, I, I like this. You know, he said he threw all those trophies away because they didn't need them anymore because he didn't need the approval of the world You may not throw all your trophies away, but given enough years, all your trophies are gonna be trashed. If you don't throw them away, somebody else will. Because they're not gonna care about your bowling trophy. (laughs) Or your little league trophy. Or the the brass ring, or the gold watch, or anything like that. But what these guys are doing is they're laying up treasures in heaven. And you can do that wherever you are, if you are a minister of Jesus Christ, wherever you are. Now, today I was trying to talk to you about five keys to a life of significance, a life that makes a difference, a life that leads a legacy, makes an impact. And I gave you four, there's one more you need to do. If you're gonna live a life of significance, if you're gonna live a great life, if you're gonna be a great man, if you're gonna leave a legacy, the fifth thing you must do is this. You must have the courage to stand alone. You must have the courage to stand alone. Great people never follow the crowd, never. In fact, they lead the crowd. They're unwilling to follow the same path of everybody else. Great people buck conventional wisdom. They're unafraid to do of what's popular. They counter cultural opinions. They go against the majority. You don't become great by being like everybody else. To be great, you must have courage. This is true in any area of life. All of the greatest scientists, the Galileos and the Copernicuses, bucked conventional wisdom. They went against the crowd. The great explorers who were told it can't be done went ahead and did it and climbed Mount Everest and did all those different things. Uh, The great social leaders uh, of of history, the Abraham Lincolns, the Martin Luther Kings, the William Wilberforce, who the man who finally got the United Kingdom to outlaw slavery and slave trading in the British Empire. When he started that, that cause to end slavery in the British Empire, he was the only guy in parliament in favor of ending it. 
and it took him 26 years to finally get a winning vote. But that was persistence. It was persistence. And he was willing to be alone for 26 years. And you must be willing to not care about the approval of other people if you're gonna be a great person, a great man or great woman. Let me show you some scriptures. They're on your outline, we'll close. Exodus 23, verse two. Don't join any crowd that intends to do evil and don't be swayed in your testimony by the opinion of the majority. Why? Because the majority is often wrong. 1 Corinthians 16, stand true to what you believe. Be courageous, be strong. And everything you do must be done with love. Isaiah 32, verse eight. An honorable person acts honestly and stands firm for what is right. Do you know how unusual that is today? All of those verses talk about that it takes courage to not care about what other people think. It takes courage to have the courage to stand alone. You know, I do a lot of these media interviews and because I'm a pastor, they always want me to comment on moral issues and social issues and stuff like that. They're always trying to get me to change my mind and I'm going, wait a minute, here's what the Bible says and I just, I don't get to decide what's right and wrong. God does. And so I just do what, what God says is right and what God says is wrong, I, I don't do. And I remember one time I was on, a, I think it was CNN, I think it was a, one of the times I was on Piers Morgan and he was trying to get me to, he said, well, well, are you ever gonna agree to the redefinition of marriage? And I said, no. And he, I said, I don't get to choose what's right or wrong and God's idea was marriage. That's not man's idea, God made it up. Going back to Genesis and he said, why do you think you would never change your mind on this? And I said, well, because, Pierce, I fear the disapproval of God more than I fear your disapproval or the disapproval of society. <laughs> and for the first time, I think Piers Morgan was speechless. Because he didn't have any, most people don't have any conviction. They have no foundation that is unchanging. And so this way I believe this, and tomorrow I believe this, and the next day I'm with you, oh, then I'll believe that with you. They don't have any solid foundation. And when the earthquakes come, like a son who takes his life, they don't have anything to hold them up. They don't have anything to hold them up. First Chronicles 12:32 talks about a group of men called the men of Issachar. That's a small tribe. It says, there were 200 men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what they ought to do. Would you circle those two phrases? They understood the times and they knew what they ought to do. We desperately need men of Issachar in today's society, in today's culture, in today's world. We need men who understand the times they're not out of date. And they know what to do. They know they have a firm foundation. Now, that, friends, is a legacy. Let me remind you that those men of Issachar, that was 4,000 years ago. I'd call that a legacy. 4,000 years later, we're talking about a group of guys because they understood their time and knew what they ought to do. Is anybody ever going to say that about you? A thousand years from today, are you gonna have any kind of legacy where they, that guy understood the times and knew what ought to be done? That's a man of Issachar. We need men and women of Issachar today. First Samuel 10, 12, be courageous. Let us fight bravely to save our people and the cities of our God. May the Lord's will be done. What's needed is courage, this courage to stand alone. Now, he says, Cur be courageous, why? Because following Christ is not for wimps. Fitting in is for wimps. Being a chameleon is for wimps. Keeping your mouth shut when things go wrong, that's for wimps. Edmund Burke said, the only thing for evil to triumph good is for good people to do nothing. The only thing needed for evil to triumph is for good people to say nothing. Be courageous. Then it says, let us fight bravely to save our people and the cities. Fight bravely. I don't know if you realize it, friend, but we're in a battle. 
We're in a battle between good and evil. We're in the battle between right and wrong. And it's raging in our culture. We're in a battle between God and Satan. When Matthew died a little over a year ago, there was enormous attacks going on and people on the internet were actually making fun of his death and saying all kinds of vile and obscene things against me and him and celebrating it. And I remember Amy, my oldest, saying to me, Daddy, Satan picked the wrong family to pick a fight with. He's gonna lose big time. And he has. Because we never waste a hurt. God wants us to use it. And so we started raising the issue of mental illness and we did a conference. We began talking about it. And now there have been national news magazines like Time and Newsweek and, and there have been uh, uh, documentaries on TV and the whole issue of mental illness is being raised up and we're meeting uh, some of Saddleback staff with the hospitals in this area and in Orange County and lots of changes are going on and good is actually coming out of bad. Satan is going to lose in that battle. Then he says we're to be courageous to save people and our cities. I have the, the privilege of being in a lot of the great cities in America. This last week I was in inner city Baltimore. A couple weeks earlier I was in inner city uh, Chicago. And I want to tell you the cities in America are crumbling at the core. There's chaos there's violence, there's negativity, and what we need are men of Issachar who know what to do, understand the times and know what to do, and have the courage to save our people and our cities. Do you remember about a year and a half ago, there was this young kid who went into the school in Newtown, Massachusetts, and shot a bunch of children, you remember that? Who ever heard of children shooting children? That used to be such a rare occurrence. But since Newtown, a year and a half ago, there have been 74 school shootings in the United States of America. Friend, that is a symptom of an incredibly sick society. Something is terribly wrong when babies are killing babies and children are children killing children and you can't even put your kids in school and not worry about it. What we need today are men and women of Issachar. Now on this Father's Day, I want to close with a prayer of blessing for all the guys in our church. So at all of our locations, I'm just going to ask all the men to stand right now as I close in prayer uh, in this service. So let's just have the men stand and I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing. And I want to say to those of you guys, I, I hope you will meet me this Thursday, 6.30 a.m., right here in this building. God is looking for men of Issachar, and so am I. God is looking for men who will be kingdom builders, not wealth builders, and so am I. And I guarantee you that if you'll join me in this next five year journey, it will not be easy, but it'll be the adventure of your life. It doesn't matter what your past is, your past doesn't matter, your race doesn't matter, your age doesn't matter, your wealth doesn't matter, your education doesn't matter. What matters is that you say the most dangerous prayer to God, use me. And I dare you to do that. Let's bow for prayer. Father, as I look out on these guys that I care about, that I love, I thank you that they're here today. When so many people are out living for themselves, they're here to study your word. I pray that each of us will make God the foundation of our lives. You have said that reverence for God gives a man deep strength and what we need today are men with deep strength you said their children will have a place of refuge and security help us to build our firm foundation on Jesus Christ and Lord when everybody else is running the race for acquisitions and achievements and accomplishments and appearance help us to remember that what matters most is love to love you and to love 
our wives, our sisters, our families, our kids, our friends, and yes, even our enemies. You have said that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And no matter what else we do, if we have not love, it is of no value. Help us to remember, Jesus, that you said that our care for others is the measure of our greatness. Lord, some of us have some tough decisions to make this week about the friends we've been hanging out with. Some of us need to drop some friends that aren't real friends. They're holding us back, they're pulling us down. They're not leading us in the right direction, they're leading us in the wrong direction. Help us to gather the right companions, to join the company of good men and women, as you've said, who keep us on the right and true path. To be in a group, to be in a church, to take one-on-one, help, help us to find that fellowship that we need. I pray that every man and even every woman here will commit to a greater purpose. You've said if you wanna be great, be the servant of all. Help us to give our lives away and learn what it means to really live. We realize that everything else is gonna burn up, it's gonna pass away, but the man who does the will of God will live forever. And most important of all, I pray for these men standing that you give them a new sense of courage. The courage to stand alone, to be an honorable person, a man of honor, to be strong, to do everything in love, but to not be swayed by the opinions of the majority. I pray that you would raise up a new group of men of Issachar who understand the times and know what to do. And use these men who are standing to save our people and to save our cities. And I pray this blessing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.